Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. COVID vaccination efforts hit a snag this week. Following federal guidance, Indiana paused its use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Ahead, the potential blow to public confidence in all of the vaccines. It's just so new, Angela. It, it's only been out, it's not been out a year. How can you trust something that is that new? Monthly payments of as much as $300 per child are expected to start this summer. What this is gonna accomplish is speed up that recovery for low to moderate income Hoosiers. And about 1 in 10 Hoosiers don't have access to broadband internet. That means working from home, e-learning, and Zoom calls with grandparents nearly impossible. While legislation aims to fix it, there's still a long way to go. COVID has really accelerated this awareness, but now comes the response. What can we do about it? Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Indiana paused its distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine earlier this week after six women who had received the vaccine developed blood clots. The women were between the ages of 18 and 48 and one has since died. Now that led the CDC and FDA to recommend pausing the use of the vaccine and left sites scrambling to reschedule appointments. Healthcare providers who have been combating vaccine hesitancy worry about potential unintended consequences of the pause. Brock Turner has the story. Ryan Engelking and his team at Engelking RX in Mitchell found out about the decision to pause the use of Johnson & Johnson vaccines through media reports early Tuesday morning. Two of his staff members spent the day on the phone calling about 200 people who were scheduled to receive the vaccine there this week. It's challenging because it changes our workflow a little bit. You know, we, we come in expecting one thing, but in reality, we had to deal with this and, and we, we did it head on. I mean, we, we took it upon us to, to get a hold of the patients and let them know what was going on. Vaccine clinics across the state had to take similar steps. Around 6,000 people were scheduled to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine at a mass clinic at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway this week. The state quickly shelved those shots and replaced them with the two-dose Moderna vaccine. DePaul scrapped its plans to administer the J&J &J vaccine to around 500 students and staff. The State Department of Health helped the school get doses of the Pfizer vaccine instead. We know we've got students as well as employees, their dependents, their household members who have not been vaccinated yet and we're counting on this vaccine opportunity, what can we do? And at that point, what we asked them for was actually to provide us Pfizer on campus. The government says there are no greater risk of clots from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, unlike those handful of women who developed them after taking the J&J &J vaccine. But the clot concerns could undermine public confidence in all of the COVID-19 vaccines. The main skepticism that I am seeing is not, you know, political conspiracy theory, microchips, stuff like that, but we're seeing, it's just so new, Angela. It, it's only been out, it's not been out a year. How can you trust something that is that new? And so we're constantly trying to educate them. This setback comes as COVID cases and deaths in Indiana continue to climb. The state topped 700,000 confirmed cases this week, while the death toll is inching closer to 13,000. The positivity rate across Indiana has steadily increased for two months. Hingle King says only about half of the people his staff contacted to reschedule their vaccines did. About half were interested. They want to go ahead and get vaccinated, so they were going to take what they could, uh, what was available and what they could get. And I would say probably the other half wanted to wait for the Johnson and Johnson. But health officials warn the state is in a race against more infectious variants. 
Getting people vaccinated is the key, they say, to preventing a third wave of the virus. Cox worries some people will use the FDA's decision as confirmation bias that all vaccines were rushed or unsafe. While she understands the hesitancy, she's keeping her trust in proven scientific methods. What this means is that our process works. That's why it takes so long for a medication to come through the U.S., and we're used to that. Um, so to me, uh, it, it didn't scare me. It didn't worry me. It just re instilled in me that we have a safe and good process and we're, we're working, working the plan. Around 20% of Hoosiers are considered fully vaccinated. More than 130,000 have received the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine, though none of the reported cases of blood clots have been linked back to Indiana. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. We're joined now by Graham McKean, the Assistant Director of Public and Environmental Health at IU to talk more about the vaccines. Hello, Graham. Were you surprised that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was put on hold, you know, knowing that there were just those six cases of blood clots out of more than six million doses administered? After reading about it, not surprised, but personally a little surprised at the beginning. I did not read personally the phase three trial data where they did say there could be a potential association with these ultra rare blood clots. Uh, but it's so rare, it's really hard to make those associations until millions of people have been vaccinated. So um, I'm also not surprised, as, as they were just saying, this is how the system is supposed to work. This is how why we pay the FDA, the CDC, and these third-party safety boards to do these things. And there's an incredibly high bar of safety with respect to vaccines. We're seeing that process work in real time. And, you know, the risk of severe blood clots from COVID infection remains much higher than any risk of any vaccine. What impact will taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine out of the rotation mean? Uh, it doesn't help. I think the, the bigger impact might be hesitancy, even though um, you know there should be a lot of trust in this process. But honestly, the, the J&J supply really wasn't quite there yet. It only accounted for about 9% of all U.S. immunizations. What I think we miss the most with this vaccine is the attractiveness and convenience of a one-dose series, especially for transient groups or others that might be hard to, to track down or complete those two-dose two series. So luckily, we have a good supply of the mRNA vaccines, and maybe we'll see the CDC committee maybe recommend that younger folks get this um, or not get this uh, uh, the particular vaccine. You know, there's already a lot of COVID fatigue now with the issues with the vaccines. How concerned are you? People will just, you know, throw their hands up. Uh, yeah, I think that's we're constantly concerned about that. But I think we also need to keep in mind that 100 or 560,000 Americans have died of this. And if we throw our hands up, this will probably only last longer. More concerning variants could emerge. More people could be severely Ill, Ill hospitalized or worse. So our fastest way forward is to sign up for one of these amazing mRNA vaccines. Their incredible safety profiles. Which we've now administered nearly 200 million of them in the U.S. over several months with very uh, without any safety signals. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. And uh, of course, there'll be more to come, I'm sure. Thank you. Well, President Biden's American Rescue Plan provides a $1.9 trillion to help the country recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Part of the plan includes an expanded child tax credit for 2021 that will provide direct payments to parents. The IRS announced this week those will start in July. Mitch Legan reports that for many families, the relief can't come soon enough. Every day, life seems to be inching closer to normal. The weather's getting warmer, businesses are hiring, and more people are getting vaccinated. But in the Carey household on Bloomington's south side, things are far from normal. Hopefully I'll be able to go full time soon. I was talking to my boss about it. Eliza Carey was working full time as a retail manager when the pandemic hit. School went virtual and her kids' grades started slipping. She knew she had to make a change. I was like, okay, this is not going to work. This is just, <laughs> it's not, especially with them being at home and them needing my attention. So now I'm part-time uh, with IU Health. It's been a trade-off. She now has time to help with things like schoolwork, but it's harder to make ends meet. Oh, uh, so, yeah, so much school, right? It's the same situation in countless Hoosier households. Low to moderate income families are still having those, those impacts. In some ways, it's even worse because so service sector workers were so impacted um, by this particular downturn. Over 800,000 Hoosiers live in poverty, and more than a quarter of them are children. For a family of four, that's an annual income of less than about $26,000.
Those numbers are pre-pandemic, though. Many Hoosiers, including Kerry, are worse off now than before. And the impact on children could be long-lasting. Think of the millions of people going to sleep at night staring at the ceiling thinking, my God, what am I going to do tomorrow? According to some experts, the expanded credit could cut child poverty in half. It'll increase the child tax credit to $3,600 per child under six and $3,000 for kids up to 17. To get the aid out faster, the IRS is sending half the credit as direct payments. It's a strategy that hasn't been tried in the U.S. before. And so it's structured very similarly to kind of a guaranteed basic income idea. You know, often guaranteed basic incomes apply to everyone. You know, this is kind of a guaranteed basic income for kids in particular. And probably the most important aspect is that the credit's now fully refundable, which means more families will benefit. Originally, you could only get the tax credit if you paid a certain amount in taxes, which meant many of the poorest families who needed the help most weren't eligible. The Center for Budget and Policy Priorities estimate that 1.4 million Hoosier children under 18 will benefit from this expansion in some way. Those same estimates say the tax credit will lift 80,000 Indiana children above the poverty line. Currently, most of the money Carrie makes goes toward her rent. SNAP benefits help with groceries. She says the expanded credit and monthly payments will go a long way for people living paycheck to paycheck. To be able to pay bills on time and to be able to save some money, you know what I'm saying? So, and I've never, like, been, you know, stand above water. I've never been able to do that, save. So I'm really excited about that. And the impacts of lifting children out of poverty are hard to understate. They're more likely to graduate high school and go to college and less likely to be involved in criminal activity. They tend to live longer and healthier lives. The list continues. As a parent, you always want your kids to be better than you. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's what I want for them, you know, me and their father. I want them to be better. The expansion is only set to last this year, though, since it's part of the larger COVID Recovery Act. But prominent Democrats, including the president, have said they'd like to see it stick around as part of broader anti-poverty efforts. A few Republicans have pitched similar programs, but say the current iteration of the credit will encourage government dependence and lead to inflation. If you're writing off $3,000 per kid, you know, for huge numbers of families, I mean, that's, you know, for a lot of families, that's the entire tax bill, and then, and then you're sending money out the door. Politicians will be debating the expansion's effectiveness soon enough. Payments haven't been sent out yet, but they're giving many Hoosier families optimism for the future. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. <laughs> Indiana University is beginning the transition process to a new leader. The school's Board of Trustees announced a successor Friday morning to replace current president Michael McRobbie, who will be retiring June 30th. Mitch Legan has the story. IU's Board of Trustees announced Pamela Witten as the 19th president of the Indiana University system on Friday. I've always considered IU to be among the best public universities in the country, and so, so I am humbled and I am honored and I am excited to be joining IU. Witten had been president of Kennesaw State University in Georgia since 2018. There, she oversaw the school's transition to a Research II university. Indiana University is a Research I institution. She's succeeding current President Michael McRobbie, who announced his retirement last August. She'll be the first woman president in IU's history. Trustee members touted her record of increasing enrollment at Kennesaw State, fundraising, and commitment to diversity. In the area of diversity, she elevated the chief diversity office to the cabinet level and reorganized the university's Office of Diversity and Inclusion to expand its scope and responsibility. Witten is taking over after a pandemic year that upended regular business for universities across the nation. But she expects things to be back to normal for the IU system's fall semester. It's looking like we should be able to return uh, to the fall in the fall to a regular full normal semester. And so um, that's the plan. She's scheduled to assume her role as president July 1st. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Mayors from Bloomington, Columbus, and Terre Haute talk about their plans for the federal money they get from the American Rescue Plan. And more than 3,000 Monroe County residents now have broadband internet thanks to a partnership between REMC and Smithville Fiber. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk.
Ready to watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere, on nearly any device? It's easy with the PBS Video app. Simply download the PBS Video app on your mobile or streaming device. Now you can watch the latest PBS episodes or catch up on the shows you missed, discover new favorites from PBS, and local content from your PBS station. Welcome to the Amanpour on PBS. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London, giving you the global view. I've covered the world for nearly three decades, and I'm dedicated to bringing you all the facts. Please join me for conversations with newsmakers, world leaders. Good to be with you, Christiane. Artists and writers, the people who define, change, and challenge our world. That's Amanpour on PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Indiana lawmakers will have about $2 billion more to use in the new state budget after an updated projection of state tax revenues was unveiled Thursday. Legislative leaders say the new money creates a unique and amazing and exciting budget opportunity. They attribute the big increase in future state tax dollars to increased job stability, higher consumer confidence, a successful vaccine rollout, and an influx of federal COVID-19 relief. Uh, this is not a time for us to grow government, but rather a time to make investments that can eliminate debt, pay down pension obligations to free up money that the state can use in the future. Education advocates are already among the loudest voices calling for increased funding with the new money. They say it puts within reach a recommendation from Governor Eric Holcomb's Teacher Compensation Commission to Indiana increase K-12 funding by $600 million per year. Lawmakers are aiming to finalize the new state budget by the end of next week. Republican lawmakers set up a potential court fight Thursday when they overrode Governor Eric Holcomb's veto of emergency powers legislation. The measure allows the General Assembly to call itself into special session during a public emergency, which is potentially uncon unconstitutional. The governor insists the Indiana Constitution only gives him the authority to call the special session and veto the bill. Let's hope it never happens again. It does happen again. And, and there is concerns about the actions taken by the governor, um, you know, a, a future governor. Then, then we can, you know, the, the legislative body has an opportunity to, to, to come back and engage. The new legislation is a reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and many lawmakers frustration at feeling sidelined while Holcomb issued dozens of executive orders. Well, Indiana legislative leaders are planning to postpone the official end date of the 2021 session by several months because of delays around redistricting. The U.S. Census Bureau has said the data lawmakers need to redraw district lines will be heavily delayed. But a provision in Indiana law that says if legislators don't redraw congressional districts before they adjourn the session, a special commission draws them instead. Senate President Pro Tem Roderick Bray says that's the only reason they're considering not adjourning. Well, a bill that would get rid of state protections for some wetlands in Indiana narrowly passed the Senate. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports, there's only one stop before the controversial bill becomes law, Governor Holcomb's desk. Supporters of the bill say Indiana's current wetlands law is too strict, causing home prices to go up and creating conflicts between farmers and state environmental regulators. The current bill no longer gets rid of all state wetland protections, but among other things, you wouldn't have to get a permit to build on the state's smallest type of wetland or a wetland in a farm field. The bill also creates a task force to study issues with the wetlands law. Senator Sue Glick says when you build on a wetland, you're destroying an important resource that may have taken hundreds of years to form, and that's difficult and expensive to replace. This is more than throwing the baby out with the bathwater. This is throwing the bathwater, the, the storm water, the lake water, and the whole water system out. Governor Eric Holcomb spoke out against the bill in the past, but there's no telling if he'll veto this current version. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. The American Rescue Plan Act allocates $350 billion to states, counties, and cities for COVID-19 emergency response and economic efforts. But local officials are still waiting on guidance on how to spend it. 
Terre Haute Mayor Duke Bennett says the city's first deposit of the American Rescue Plan Act fund is supposed to arrive by May 11th. The problem is he can't start working on what to do with it. And today, sitting right here, I have no guidance on how I can really spend that. Terre Haute is slated to receive more than $38 million. Bennett says $19 million of that arrives in less than a month. If I was going to spend some of this on wastewater, which that's one of the infrastructure, one of the three buckets within the infrastructure bucket, um, can I use it for design in a project or do I just have to use it on a project that's ready to go? It's a problem all local leaders are dealing with. Columbus has allocated $16 million. Mayor Jim Linup says the first step is trying to assess the extent organizations have been affected by the pandemic. Uh, the Vister Center, for example, has had its revenues uh, significantly reduced because of the uh, reduction in stays at uh, hotels. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the areas that we would look at. We would also take a look at uh, you know, some of the social service agencies. Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton says the almost $29 million the city is projected to get would defer the need for a possible local income tax increase. We don't know all the details, but it, it may well be that that national stimulus and rescue package will mean we don't need to do immediate local revenue generating because of that. Counties will get millions of dollars more. Bennett says it will take coordination to make sure no one gets left out. When it comes to not-for-profits and other projects that are going on, we want to make sure that we can make both of our dollars, you know, get, the, get, get that value out of that. Now, Bedford is set to receive more than $2.7 million, Spencer about $470,000, and Nashville $230,000. Well, around 1 in 10 Hoosiers don't have access to reliable broadband internet. That makes e-learning, remote work, and Zoom calls to grandparents nearly impossible. While, while a plethora of bills and millions of dollars in investment have tried to solve the problem, many Hoosiers are left buffering. Brock Turner reports. Some residents in Monroe County were finally connected this week. The project announced last year is expected to link 3,400 customers to fiber internet. A partnership between the area's REMC and Smithville Fiber made it possible. Leaders think this is a model that can be employed across the state. Come together in the interest of, of these homeowners and business owners and the other, you know, 3,400 some homeowners, putting aside some of those competitive uh, uh, aspects is is truly tremendous and really groundbreaking. That's Scott Rudd, the state's director of broadband opportunity. He says without this partnership, it could have taken years for some customers to have reliable internet. There may have been no other way to make this possible in the next decade, perhaps. Investments like these pay for themselves, experts say. Roberto Gallardo is the director of Purdue's Center for Regional Development. He and his team have studied the return on investment in Indiana. So that study we did um, that found on average a $4 return for every dollar invested. The two main drivers, Brock, were telehealth, that's pre-COVID, okay, was telehealth and adult education. Those two were really driving that ROI. It is worth it. Policymakers at the state and federal level have taken notice. For years, Indiana has worked to create the regulatory environment to incentivize builds. This session, nearly a half dozen bills have the chance to be passed before the General Assembly concludes its work. Among those is Senate Bill 377, which establishes a statewide grant program for providers. It passed both chambers with significant bipartisan support. One of the authors, Eric Cook, has been working on the issue for decades and believes one major hurdle could soon be cleared. Fortunately, that financial obstacle, which is the impediment particularly to rural broadband, um, is looks like we finally may be able to uh, bridge it with a significant amount of um, state and local dollars that appear to be headed this way. President Joe Biden's infrastructure plan has a proposed $100 billion in infrastructure investments, but the details are unclear and just how much of those funds will go to unserved areas is still up in the air. Either way, for residents like Peter Gold, who spoke out in favor of the project before it was first approved, any momentum is positive. All of the neighbors on our road, Kerr Creek Road, uh, improvise. So in our case, we're using a thumb drive to drive a Wi-Fi router, and our connection might be four, four meg sometimes, two meg sometimes. The data is limited.
So usually we're limit, we run out of data or get close to running out of data, especially when there's a Microsoft or an Apple update that comes through automatically. And Gallardo agrees. We know they're not served, adequately served. And there's a reason for that, right? They're, we've been through this. There's, they need to make money. It's a business. So what can we do to make it work? We can't just say, well, you know, the ROI is not there. Good luck. It's going to have to be public-private partnership. There's no other way. And, um, and I think that that's powerful. And that Gallardo says he hopes the Biden administration incentivizes these types of partnerships to make builds like this one a lot more common. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. And the state of Indiana lost a basketball legend earlier this week when Bob Slick Leonard passed away at the age of 88. Leonard was a high school star at Terre Haute Gerstmeyer before going to IU, where he made the game-winning free throw to beat Kentucky in the 1953 championship game. That's all the time we have. More online. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you.